Hello and welcome to our 2022 career panel event for folks majoring in psychology and cognitive science here at UC Davis. We are joined by some fabulous professionals who are going to share with you information about the professions they're in. We're going to have plenty of time for audience question and answer. So in just a bit, I'm going to have folks introduce themselves. And while you're listening to them summarize some brief description about their work, you can be jotting down the questions that you have. Um, feel free to put stuff in the Zoom chat at any point and the moderators of the event will be directing them to the folks. Uh, you'll see that the panelists have their job titles right by their name in their Zoom window, and that's for your convenience so that you know who you're addressing your question to. Feel free to address a, quest a question to an individual panelist, or you can pose a question to the whole panel. Um, so, I am Stacy Jenkins. I'm one of the academic advisors for students majoring in psychology and cognitive science. I will be helping to moderate this event. And we also have a few other advisors joining us. So um, Rachel, if you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Rachel Hale. I'm another advisor with Stacy for psychology and cognitive science. And yeah, welcome to our event. Can't talk today. <laughs> And Tyler, go ahead. Hello, I'm a peer advisor in the Yellow Cluster, also working closely with Stacy. It's great to be here. Are there any other advisors in the room? Hello, all. I'm Melina Gillies Doherty. I'm one of the uh, members of the undergraduate advising team in the Yellow Cluster. Anyone else? All right, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to start with Professor Ron Mangan. I will have you introduce yourself, and then when you're done, I'll pass the baton to somebody else. Okay, thank you, Stacy. Well, it's really a pleasure to be here today. I think this is a great course and a great offering for people who aren't in the seminar, uh, real service to our students, and a lot of fun for those of us that get to participate today on the panel. So thank you all for organizing this. Uh, my name is Ron Mangan. I'm a professor here at UC Davis. And uh, so it, on, on the one hand, you all know what I do. On the other hand, you have no idea what I do. And that's part of the goal for today. So I'm, a, I'm an academic scientist. I am a professor here. And what that means in the University of California is, is that I uh, have three parts of my job, research, teaching, and service. And uh, I, that means I run a research laboratory. You can see behind me, I'm in the Center for Mind and Brain. I'm actually the director of the Center for Mind and Brain, which is a research institute here on the campus. And I run a laboratory that's, uh, that does research on how the brain controls attention, which is really important for being online like this. Can you maintain the focus of your attention on what we're doing today and what things are going to distract you? So we use advanced brain imaging methods to investigate the brain systems that control attention. Uh, I also teach, and uh, I. not every professor writes a textbook, but I made that mistake years ago, but it's been a real rewarding experience, and it's uh, my textbook, Cognitive Neuroscience, is in its sixth edition now, or going into a sixth edition, and I use that to teach my class uh, here, Cognitive Neuroscience, the Biology of the Mind, which I'm teaching this winter. I have 320 students in it. It's a upper division psychology course, but students from uh, various different majors, NPB and psychology and cog sci in particular, those three, but also other majors uh, are in the class. Um, let's see, I think you wanted to know a little bit about uh, what I do day to day very quickly. Um, being a university professor is very different depending on what kind of university you're in. So there are some I think you will know that focus more on teaching, some that focus more on research, all focus on sort of all three teaching research and service, service to the university, service to the society, scientific society, to society more generally. Um, but there's a balance, how much you, you, you weigh to research versus teaching versus service, it sort of depends on the institution you're in. 
we're in a, in a high research output institution at UC Davis, which means that the research component of my position as an academic scientist is a big chunk of what I do. I run a lab that has uh, about 15 people in it, including undergraduates, graduate students, and postdoctoral uh, researchers. The work we do is supported by grants from the National Institute of Health, National Institutes of Health, National Institute of Mental Health in particular. And that's a lot of my time. Um, but of course, the teaching is, is an important component. And for in a research university like this, part of my job is to translate my research into my classroom and back again. So I don't see them as separate parts of the job. Uh, they certainly are very different parts of the job, but they're not separate. You know, what I do in my research strongly informs uh, the textbook I wrote and, and how I give my lectures and how I deliver the information to the students because I can tell them and I often will be telling them about things that are happening in my laboratory at the moment or things that we recently struggled with or discovered or failed to discover all of those kinds of things. By way of my background, um, I've uh, before I came here, I was at, at Dartmouth College uh, in the American Ivy League University system. And uh, I was uh, a professor for several years at Duke University. And I say that, I start by saying that because that usually terrifies people. And it shouldn't, it's just different jobs I've had. But I wanna, I say it because I wanna contrast it with what my background is, um, because I think it's really useful for students to know how people get to the different jobs that they get to. You know, University of California is a highly ranked institution. How did I get this job? Well, when I was 18, my father died and I took a little time off. We generously call that a gap year now. In, in those days, it was I dropped out of college uh, for about a year. And then I returned to community college. That's what I could afford. And I worked uh, for the first year or so as a janitor in a community hospital in the evenings, which was a great job to have, I'll tell you. I actually felt like I was doing something good. And then later, I had other jobs, TAing and so on. And then I transferred to university. And I was really lucky to get an undergraduate research experience as an undergraduate. And that's why I value that so much here and try to support that uh, with students in my lab and at the university. And then I was really lucky. I made a decision based on the research experience largely and my, my personal background. My father was a scientist uh, to, um, to go into graduate education. And I was really lucky to be like you all and uh, enter the University of California where I've spent most of my career really. So I did my PhD at UC San Diego. I actually started at UCLA and then I was at UC San Diego for my PhD and then uh, many years here at UC Davis. So that's, uh, that's sort of me in a nutshell. And I, I wanted to point that out because a lot of people feel like they, I know people feel like they don't belong or they're not sure what they're doing with their career or how a person gets from A to B. And I went to a tiny little community college in the middle of Northern Arizona that you never heard of, a place called the Avapai College. And I taught in the Ivy League, and now I'm in the University of California. And I think that that's just a really great, for me, I wanna tell students that because I think that's a very, really great example of how careers can go. And uh, uh, it, I, I look forward to answering any questions that you might have about you know, the various twists and turns of my career, because there were a lot of them. Uh, it wasn't the smooth path that Hollywood could have written. It was a maybe it was a Hollywood script, but you know, the one on the darker side, right? Um, and that's a little bit about me. Thank you so much. Let's now hear from Arya Ahmed. Thanks for the introduction. That's going to be a hard one to follow up on, so I'll do my best. Uh, I'm Farya Ahmed. I'm a pediatric genetic counselor here at UC Davis. Uh, I work on, at the MIND Institute on the medical campus in Sacramento under the Department of Pediatrics Division of Genomic Medicine. Um, my patient, so my role is a patient facing role. Uh, so my patients are primarily pediatric patients, um, but the running joke in genetic counseling is that we see uh, a crib to cradle or cradle to coffin. Um, so we have pediatric all the way up to adult patients um, with suspected genetic conditions. 
Um, so typically they've been referred to us by other specialty providers or sometimes primary care providers um, within the system with a combination of different features that um, haven't been able to find a diagnosis so far. So they come over to genetics. Uh, we work very closely with MD geneticists, so uh, doctors who also see patients with us. Um, we do intakes, family history evaluations, um, we recommend specific genetic testing if we see that it is warranted, um, and then we'll send it out. We don't do the testing ourselves. <laughs> A lot of people ask us that. Um, most of it gets sent out. Uh, and then we review genetic testing results with patients and families. Um, and depending on the outcome of that testing, we either continue with genetic testing if it was non-diagnostic. Non um, if a diagnosis is made, we do see our patients long-term in the genetics clinic, depending on what that diagnosis is made. Um, and then because it's the genes and genes are inherited, we oftentimes end up seeing um, individuals, family members as well um, in our clinic following up. Um, so that's pediatric or general genetics. There's also prenatal and cancer genetic counseling, which I do not work with, um, but those providers also exist here at UC Davis and elsewhere. Um, prenatal genetic counseling works with um, more family planning perspective. So uh, patients are typically mothers who are actively pregnant or couples who are seeking to become pregnant who have family histories of genetic conditions or they have a preg current pregnancy that has a suspected genetic condition based on ultrasound abnormalities. Uh, and then cancer genetic counseling is um, patients who have either a current diagnosis of cancer that is suspected to have a hereditary component or a family history of hereditary cancer that warrants additional workup. Um, so all three of those professions, uh, or I guess subsects of professions are under the genetic counseling profession. So um, I completed my undergrad at CU Boulder in biochemistry and molecular biology. Um, and I had a very roundabout way to get to genetic counseling. So not everyone has this route, but I actually worked in um, bench work science. So um, basic lab science for a couple of years. Um, and really miss the human interaction. So after that, I worked in community health outreach for federally qualified health centers in Colorado. Uh, and then after that, I worked as a clinical research coordinator for pediatric um, research. And then from there, finally stumbled my way into um, genetic counselors and the de departments of genetics and realized that I enjoyed their work more than any other job that I've had. <laughs> So at that point, I went back to school and received my master's of science in genetic counseling. Um, so it is a master's degree that is required um, to become a genetic counselor, um, as well as board certification after you graduate from that degree. Um, as far as um, prerequisites and backgrounds, um, we have a wide variety of people coming from different backgrounds, my colleagues. So, um, Prereqs typically include um, biology, first or two semesters of biology, chemistry, an intro genetics course, a psychology course, statistics, um, and then uh, some other ones. So really any kind of science-based um, undergraduate degree um, is a good fit. Uh, Although my role is patient facing, there are genetic counselors who work at genetic testing laboratories, um, and a large part of their role is actually analyzing um, the genetic testing data. Um, so genetic counselors really have a, hands in a lot of different pots right now, and it's a very exciting and dynamic field um, to be in currently. Um, in an academia type of position, so with a university like UC Davis, um, our roles are primary clinical. Um, we also work closely in research with the MIND Institute at UC Davis. Um, so quite a few of our patients, um, while they're seen clinically, they are also involved in research. Um, and then uh, we do also have the opportunity to do some teaching with some of the uh, medical students. Um, and sometimes some of the undergrad students as well and some opportunities like this. 
Um, some other areas that genetic counselors work in is in the state department. So um, with the newborn screening program, so for the genetic conditions that are part of those newborn screening programs, there are genetic counselors there as well, um, as well as industry. So the labs that complete uh, the genetic testing. Um, I am at home today. Today is my admin day, but I typically am in the clinic about four days a week currently. Um, so that's my quick blitz intro to genetic counseling. <laughs> Thank you. Let's now hear from Roman Shachenko. Hey, thank you, Sandy, and everybody for having me here. I'm really excited. So I am a graduate of UC Davis. I was part of the first uh, graduating class of the cognitive science major, so that's got a little bit more of the computer science -y stuff. And I also had a degree in uh, computer science as well. So I've uh, right now I'm currently working as a software engineer for uh, Google. Uh, it's a nice big company. It's uh, about 150,000 employees or so. So uh, it's kind of fun. I joined about, about two months ago, so it's a little bit a little bit new for me there. Um, before this, I was uh, working for the past four years uh, with a, another company, also software engineer, full stack type stuff. So um, it's uh, in terms of what I do uh, is uh, I am my current position. I am uh, on the uh, who has like maybe family members or whoever who who have interacted with the. Uh, Android uh, ecosystem, but the family link team, what it does is it uh, builds out. So there's an app and it lets you control a bunch of uh, parental control things uh, and sort of like uh, parental guidance things for, for kids um, uh, under 13 and then kind of graduating up to 18. There's some different rules. So there's a lot of different things that you can help uh, do through that. Uh, the whole whole idea behind it is to help kids kind of get some of that uh, uh, understanding and management of how how technology impacts their life, and, uh, build up some of those habits and stuff. That's so very very nice, uh, very interesting in terms of like social impact. Uh, and then uh, personally for me, uh, it, it's really cool because the the tech stack that I'm working with. It impacts uh, or I interact with a lot of like products across Google and uh, uh, and, and beyond. So um, how I got here, uh, well, it sounds like everybody takes a circuitous route. Uh, it's not exactly straightforward. So I actually uh, I came into UC Davis as a aerospace engineer um, and quickly shifted to something a little bit more familiar. I had uh, sort of experimented with uh, computer science back when I was in high school and just uh, wandered around using Google and th things like that. And uh, I found out that I kind of like it, but uh, also found out that there was this new major that was coming out. And uh, one of the professors of uh, philosophy that I like really admired and looked up to, I, he, he was sharing some, uh, uh, some things that were happening with this. And I, I attended some of those classes. And I found uh, uh, found some other professors who were interesting. So now psychology and philosophy, and, and uh, uh, there's like a little bit of biology and all this. And I'm like, this is all so cool. I'm, I'm so excited. So um, I ended up uh, like very nearly dropping um, my computer science major. Uh, I I kind of got overwhelmed. I was doing some internships and. I was having a hard time. I was actually um, on uh, uh, an academic probation uh, a couple of years in uh, to my major, and it was just it was just like really tough, and I wasn't sure what I was doing, and a lot of other life things and stuff. Um, and uh, I was able to get through that, but a year later, I was on academic probation, subject to dismissal. So <laughs> obviously, not everything was quite solved yet. Um, and again, I didn't have a lot of that certainty, and now I'm trying to do I'm trying to come get back to the major and you know, work with it all. So uh, um, like some of the math things were a little bit hard, so, but um, family kind of encouraged me and, and so on and so forth. And I ended up uh, keeping on going. Um, 
just like finding reasons to uh, to do one thing or another, sort of experimenting and and uh, and learning why, you know, getting some reasons for like why I should actually keep going with this thing versus something else. You know, why why should I stick to this path versus uh, exploring so many others? Um, I later sort of uh, a few things lined up in terms of that. I, I met my my now wife. And that last like year or two, I did five years at UC Davis. Uh, uh, that last year or two was actually like my best grades, my best sort of attention and everything. I kind of had a vision for my life. You know, it took me a while to figure out, but I, with that, I was able to kind of keep going. Um, I uh, worked my previous job for four years. Uh, but even then, I'm still always trying to like experiment and figure out you know, what is life going to be like for me. Uh, I did, I worked for a startup for a year and a half, uh, sort of in addition to my full-time job. Uh, it was about 10, uh, 10 hours a week or so. I also did a um, boot camp where I taught uh, like zero to uh, web developer. Uh, it's, a, it's like a six month boot camp. It was actually uh, uh, the company is Trilogy Education. They, they were partnered through UC Davis. Definitely doesn't give you as good of a background and everything, but it was it was an interesting program. A lot of people find it useful. But I, I dug into like a lot of these things. I like the teaching. I like the different kinds of work and stuff. I'm always trying to figure out what what do I like. So um, now I'm uh, you know now I'm an engineer at Google, and um, what that looks like for me is um, I'm at home. This is a uh, this is my office here. I, I work right across from from me is my my wife. She sits here and she works. Um, we have a daughter and we have a nanny. So this is kind of the environment that, that I have. Uh, and bef even before starting the Google job, this is basically what I was doing for the past like two years. Uh, with the exception of I went in like once a couple weeks or whatever. Um, I kind of think this is probably how it's going to stay for a long time. Um, it's, it's nice. There's some ways to sort of engage with my coworkers uh, and that includes like board games over the internet or whatever. So <laughs> that's, that's my sort of day-to-day -day environment. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's kind of how all those things are. In terms of what I actually do though, um, I am constantly learning. Uh, I'm, I'm like Googling. Uh, like, what did, uh, maybe one question might be, what, what did uh, my cognitive science major versus my computer science major contribute to my particular path? Uh, and I would say that um, uh, the, the biggest thing that I learned is that there are so many ways of sort of describing similar things and learning to communicate those things or sort of translate between uh, different perspectives is a really big deal. So I became a really good Googler, I think. And uh, maybe that's where I'm at right now. Thank you so much. All right, let's hear from Leah Birdsong now. Thank you, Stacy. Um, my name is Leah Birdsong. I'm a board certified behavior analyst. Um, I work in a clinic right now um, with children with autism or other developmental disabilities. Um, uh, in, within the clinic, children come uh, each day and they have a one-to-one -one teacher. Um, and so our goal is to teach life skills, communication, um, to increase their quality of life and to access um, their community and their environment. Um, so I serve um, within our company, uh, I work for Applied Behavior Consultants, and within our company, we serve adults in group homes, we serve um, parents, we do parent trainings. Um, we serve children of all ages in school, in home, in a uh, clinic based environment, um, all the way um, from, I guess, the earliest I've worked with is about 14 months, and then all the way to um, adults, um, 50s and 60 year olds. Um, so, what we do is, again, the goal is to uh, increase uh, skill deficits that they should have at their current developmental um, age or current uh, development age what should be 
their chronological age. So bridging a gap between where they are and where they um, feel that they should have and should be. So social skills, self-help, dressing, feeding, um, all of these independent life skills that are needed to um, for daily living and as they, as they grow older. Um, play skills, um, turn taking, you know, simple as like even, you know, giving eye contact to reciprocate um, social uh, social environments and social skills. Um, so general nature is I, uh, I support, I write behavior plans, I train staff who are the one-to-one -one implementers. Um, I do a lot of administrative stuff as my job has progressed and as I've moved up, it's more, more paperwork, um, less with the kiddos, but um, always try to get back to that education and experience that has um, led me to this. So I, my background is in, I got my undergrad at the University of North Texas in Denton, Texas. Um, I was born and raised in Texas. So uh, it was an uh, undergrad was in education, spe uh, specifically in special education. And then I got my master's at the University of Texas in Austin, um, uh, education, and then did an emphasis in autism and developmental disability. And the first day of um, going into, and it's like, okay, this is what courses you're going to need to take. And they were kind of like, okay, so you, when you take all these coursework, you'll end up having all your courses to be a board certified behavior analyst. And I was like, I have no idea what that is or what it entails. And I was like, but I mean, as might as well, if I'm doing the work, I might as well um, do the job. Um, so I did my coursework there. Um, got hands-on experience in the one-to-one -one environment, parent training, and serve uh, the individuals who, uh, I guess, fell below the poverty line um, in home setting. Uh, so kind of with the education, I still have my teaching credentials in Texas. I haven't used them yet, <laughs> but um, I still have them. Uh, and I moved out to California for this job specifically. Um, so that was about nine years ago because in the state of California, if you need the services, there are all insurance and um, regional centers that actually will pay 100% of the um, cost of services. Where in Texas at the time, it was kind of, if you could afford the services, then you could get them, which that didn't seem too right to me. <laughs> um, so I wanted to be able to serve anybody who could um, get those services. Um, but a lot of my colleagues have a background in um, psychology, um, too. So that's about it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So uh, we're going to get started with the Q&A portion of this event. So feel free to add whatever questions you might have in the Zoom chat. And just an FYI, if folks are in this event hoping to get information about clinical psychology and therapy and psychotherapy careers, just to let you know, we have a whole separate panel event in April just for that. Um, so we can keep our questions to folks, to things related to the folks on our panel today. For Leah, uh, how many years of schooling did you say you did? My undergrad was four years and my master's program was, was really nice. It was only um, a year, mm -hmm. uh, 36 hours of coursework. Um, in my field, you could get uh, a board to by assistant behavior analyst, which is just with a bachelor's um, degree. And that is um, another option where you have your bachelor's and you can do your ABA coursework within that, or you can get your bachelor's and then do additional ABA coursework. I think it's like 225 hours, which would, um, it's about 15 hours a semester for class. Mm -hmm. I do it real fast. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We have a question for Professor Mangan. 
Um, Antonio wants to know what's the typical work that a research assistant does in your lab? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, it, it, it's, it's really quite variable. Um, it depends a bit on the student. If you're talking about student interns, which I think you were, um, it, it really depends on the student's level of interest and engagement. So it can be everything from, uh, I think of it as it's an educational experience. So I'm not recruiting people pr principally to be, to be doing specific jobs. Okay, some labs do that. They say, okay, I have a position for an intern and this is what you're gonna do, you know, and you do your job, come in a certain number of hours. For me, it's sort of like joining the lab and it's an educational experience. And so for some people, they sort of are peripherally part of it. They kind of hang around and they, they, they learn what, what we do. You know, they read literature with us, go to our lab meetings, they participate some things in the lab. They get experience and maybe they like it and maybe they stay and maybe they don't and they go seek another internship or another lab thing. Other students might become slightly more engaged and they maybe they're interested in really the hands-on part of the, of the laboratory, the, the recording of, uh, of data itself and, and gathering the data. I could put up a, a picture here to give you a kind of, can you see this picture behind me now, Stacy? You see that? Yeah. So, you know, here we are, here's a team from my lab over at the scanner in Davis, because we do brain imaging. And so there's what you see in that group are undergraduates, graduate students, and postdoctoral people who have PhD uh, that are doing additional training. So, um, People that are becoming very engaged, like Diana, who's standing there on the right over here, she's an undergraduate. She was in the lab for a couple of years and she really became engaged in research. And you see, she's doing kind of high level stuff to work your way up to be able to go to the scanner. You have to, you have to get a lot of experience, a lot of training. You have to go through some special safety training and other kinds of things. And so she became quite engaged. And then when she graduated as a result of that kind of really detailed engagement in, in the work that we're doing, uh, she was able to get a job uh, after graduating at the imaging center here at UC Davis Medical Center. And then she, her plan is to apply to graduate school some, at some point in the future. So she's getting additional training and fattening up her, her uh, resume, if you will, for uh, applying to graduate school. So it really just varies. And I've had some students who, you know, it's rare, but, you know, five, five or less percent that really, uh, by the time that they've been in the lab for a bit, they're operating at the same level as a as an early career doctoral student. They're that they're that good because they've they've focused, they had the time and the effort, and they had the aptitude and interest, and they put it and they put in the time, and they're really doing the kind of same kind of work. Maybe they're even running their own experiments. So it's really quite quite variable, you know, from people who are just kind of sort of skimming the surface of the water as they come through as an intern. I think that's very valuable to people who become regular part of the lab and maybe even a regular researcher in the laboratory. And then there's a couple other questions for you about um, lab work. So what are the qualities that you look for when looking for research assistance and how competitive is the application process? Yeah, it's, it, it, generally, it's very competitive for all things at UC Davis. So at UC Davis, we really value students having that experience. And it doesn't have to be research. It could be doing any of the kinds of things that any of our panel members are doing and working in, in different laboratories, different settings, doing software, to, you know, to uh, working in, some, in one of the clinics and so on. Um, but, but there's, you know, the university is big, a lot of undergraduates and uh, and not, not enough positions for everybody, but we, we really try to get as many people in for as much experience as they can. So it, it ends up being competitive is the point. Um, different labs operate it differently. So I'll, I wanna kind of give you the spectrum. I'll tell you how I do it. I'll tell you a little bit how other labs do it. For me, uh, I'm very informal about it in some sense. And in fact, a lot of it's driven by my doctoral students and my postdocs themselves, especially the doctoral students who sometimes work as teaching assistants. They meet a lot of undergraduates. They see who the good undergraduates are, you know, people who ask good questions and come to office hours and get A's on all the exams and stuff. And sometimes they're the, the doctoral students themselves identify people and then they come to me and say, hey, I have a, I have a student that's shown interest and really wants to, what do you think? And then we go through a, say, okay, let's get on Zoom or, you know, it used to be we'd get in a room together and just chat and I would just make sure everything was looked good and the student understood, you know, what we were, what the responsibilities were. So that's how I do it. It, it's, it's, it happens that way. And people will write me a lot. And unfortunately, most of the time when they write me asking for a slot, like right now we're completely full, 
Um, I write them back right now, we're completely full. But I always try to answer people uh, because I, I value it so much. It was so important in my own career. Even if I'm just giving them advice about, okay, you're doing the right thing. Let me give you a little more advice. Maybe you should include a CV next time. Don't forget, we have an undergraduate research center. There's some information there that you can learn about on campus. You know, if you wrote to three people, you didn't hear anything, then write to 10 people. You don't hear anything, then write to 25 people. You didn't hear anything, right? How, how determined are you to get that experience? And, uh, and, and the TAs, as I said, are, are good. Uh, you know, get to know your TAs and ask them about you know, what opportunities might be there. Other laboratories are more formal. You go to their website and uh, there will be a button that says apply for internship or apply for a research assistant uh, you know, slot, whatever. And they literally, you, you, they've got a form and you put all your stuff in there and then push a button, submit it. And hopefully anybody ever responds to you. They might, uh, they should, but you know, it, it might be a hundred people filling out that form. And so, so then they, they go through and they have their criteria and whatever it might be. Um, I wish, in my goal as a professor at UC Davis, I wish everybody could have that experience. I wish we could make it part of the curriculum so that everybody would be guaranteed to have such an experience. I, I will say that I think that everybody who really, really wants one can get one. And it doesn't make much difference, by the way. A lot of people want to do, oh, I want to do exactly what you do in your lab. I'm so like that picture with brain imaging. That's what I want to do. Maybe that's not available. It's not important at the undergraduate level that you get the exact experience for what you think you're interested in or that you want to do in the future. That would be ideal. But it's important to get any experience. So if you had another lab that was doing work in, you know, in the ag school and they were working with animals and you, and you wanted to learn about you know, any, any kind of scientific thing that you could learn about being in a laboratory or doing scientific research or, or other or clinically relevant things, that's all valuable. And so my very first research experience I was actually a chemistry major, so it made a lot of sense in that context, was uh, had nothing to do with brains, had nothing to do with imaging, had nothing to do with any of this stuff. I was grinding boxes of this plant root, boxes and boxes of this root that was a medicinal herb that the Navajo Indians used in Northern Arizona. And my chemistry professor, organic chemistry professor was very interested in natural products chemistry, medicines that, that were used in native populations. And so, so I was taking these massive boxes of these roots, grinding them down into powder, and then doing some very simple low-level cereal extraction in the chemistry lab to, to try to pull out uh, uh, organic compounds that he could then analyze further and see what were the active, try to figure out what the active compounds, why were these uh, plants helping with whatever disease uh, or condition they were being used for. So I didn't, so, and that was valuable to me. That was tremendously valuable to have that experience and, and but it had nothing to do with what I'm doing now or even what I was principally interested in. And then one more thing about research. Um, is training included in the position or do students need to apply for or pay for additional programs? Is, is that addressed to me or to? Yes, yes. Sorry. So um, <clears throat> let me see, let me, let me read it here. It's in, is this in the chat? Um, safety training. Oh, yeah. So if you if you're an intern in the lab, then usually that's a requirement. And no, there's no additional cost. That, that stuff's just set up free. So there's National Institutes of Health and, and uh, other types of online training. If you end up at the level of the scanner, then then we offer that training at the imaging center. There's a program that you have to go through to be certified, things like that. So yeah, and then ethics training, you pick you get, you get all those different things. And there's no cost for that. So these are not Again, these are not courses exactly, right? You know, this is, and, and there's no cost to the individual. We also, someone I think asked, do, are, are, are these paid positions? And these are not, I'm talking about internships now. Okay, so um, if, if I had money, I'd be happy to, you know, spread it around to everybody, but, and, and hire, and some labs do. Some labs are hiring people for specific jobs and they may hire a person. So, but in my lab, it's an intern, it's an educational experience. Okay, we have a question for Faria. What was the most difficult aspect of getting into your career? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so right now, genetic counseling graduate programs are quite competitive to get into, and that's because there are only about 50 currently accredited programs in the country. Um, when I applied, there was about 35. So, you know, there's more and more, but, and those class sizes are on the smaller side. So they range from four to about 30 individuals per class size. Um, my graduate class was six. So 
there's a high volume of applicants um, and just unfortunately not enough spots. On the flip side, that does mean that there's a lot of job security right now because there are more genetic counseling jobs than genetic counselors in the country right now. Um, most programs uh, require some sort of genetic counseling shadowing, um, which due to um, COVID and the pandemics and so many of our visits are virtual visits, they've actually made them more accessible because students don't need to have special special, special training um, to be in a clinic or, um, you know, things that are that when they were coming um, into the clinic to shadow us, those um, kind of have been eliminated due to video visits. Um, for me specifically, I took about seven years off between undergraduate and grad school. So I actually had to go um, take a couple prereq classes um, and I was working full time at that time. So just that balance um, was more difficult for me, but um, that was a little bit more unique to my journey as well. Um, and then uh, most grad programs, if not all of them, do also require some sort of um, training in counseling or psychology so um, or experience I should say so I personally worked with um, the crisis text line and volunteered there and um, some other options and that some of my um, classmates and colleagues that were was volunteering at Planned Parenthood and other counseling shelters um, and uh, groups like that yeah. so some more unique um, prereqs that are required for for the actual application process. And it isn't, I don't want this to be a, a deterrent, but it is uncommon for um, many individuals to apply two to three times before um, getting admitted just because the volume is so high right now. Um, but hopefully UC Davis will actually have a genetic counseling program in the next um, three or four years, if not sooner. That is something that we're actively working on right now. Okay, we have a question from Roman. <clears throat> in which areas does a company like Google employ psych majors? And in your area, what kind of interaction might you have with them? Hey, thanks for the question. So I, am, I can't speak for Google, um, but I can say from personal experience that I know that there are folks who do a lot of research uh, for UI, UX, just general user experience. Uh, and those are folks that I interact with uh, directly. Uh, I know that there are teams, uh, I can see email threads, we're definitely included with them. Um, it's really, uh, there's a lot of interesting work there, but I don't, I don't personally do it myself. Um, some things that, um, like some reasons why this, this work is important is that uh, for uh, companies like Google, uh, being able to serve lots of people and having their products uh, represent and be accessible for lots and lots of people is uh, is basically the only acceptance criteria. It's not okay if the product doesn't actually serve the, the intended audience. So um, I know that the UX uh, researchers and uh, uh, designers and other folks, um, they play a very key role in all that. Uh, beyond that, I, I don't have a better guess. Okay. We have a question for Leah. What kind of work does a behavior analyst entail and what skills or experiences helped prepare you for this role? Oh, don't tell my boss that I did not mention this as um, I was explaining what I do. Um, but my work is, uh, our work is, is very data driven. Um, so our decisions are made based on that data collection. So client progress and programming um, is based on that data collection, raw data, um, and what that looks like. If a, looking at if an intervention is successful and decreasing or increasing behaviors um, with in respects to analyzing that data. Um, we look at the functions of human behavior and why we do what we do. Um, just to kind of like a brief look at is the four main functions that we look at are um, access to something, um, whether it be an activity, attention, a person. I always joke that my sister is very, um, she has a lot of attention seeking behaviors um, by telling um, embarrassing stories about 
me in front of others. Um, attention seeking escape maintained behaviors. Um, so if we want to avoid or escape a situation, um, things we do like uh, the term ghosting, right? I guess is a thing. Um, escape maintained. Um, sensory or automatic, um, which like a lot of people will call like self stimulatory behaviors. Um, and so those are kind of the things that we look at and a lot of individuals that we work with don't have those skills. And instead of being able to communicate to say like, I need a break or leave me alone, or I want, you know, that right there, um, they engage in what is called, you know, in a tantrum behavior or um, maybe some self interest behaviors um, and, and things like that. The first thing we ever want to rule out is anything medical. Um, so, we look at like medical history and medical background to um, there's been studies done with individuals with severe self-injurious behaviors um, causing like lifelong damage. Um, and before they did inpatient, they did a medical background and about 75% of them had were backed up in fecal matter up into like their diaphragm. And so you got to think about how uncomfortable that has to be. And you, we can't compete with, with pain like that. So if they're engaging in these self-interest behaviors, it's like, okay, well, let's first treat this, this medical thing and see if the behaviors go down. Um, because if we put in an intervention or something to, to replace those, and we were going to be competing with something that we're not going to be able to, <laughs> to decrease. So pain, hunger, um, sleep, those are all things that you can't compete with until that gets met. Um, so we look at like teaching again, replacement behaviors or appropriate behaviors instead of having to go into the tantrum. Um, what skills or experiences help me prepare for this role? Um, well, I mean, working with kids, it's not always necessary, um, but being able to work with kids and follow kind of their lead uh, is important. Um, knowing that, you know, putting your patient first and, and autonomy is really important. Um, you know, it's not about you. It's about the individual that you're working with um, and what's important to them. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I can't think of anything. I mean, I, I did work at home. I worked a one-on-one -on -one experience, I would say, is going to be kind of like your first step. Um, it just requires, you know, a high school degree. Um, and you can become a registered behavior technician. Uh, and doing one-to-one -one intervention and, and getting those skills and, and supervision from, from a behavior analyst. All right, thank you. Um, question for Professor Mangan. Does being involved in research as a career go hand in hand with academics? And as a student with professors who conduct research, um, Carla wonders what are common paths that don't involve the tenure route? Mm -hmm. Great, it's a good question. So, um, you know, if you're interested in research primarily, there are a lot of different directions that you can go in your career to do research and only some of them are academic. You know, it, it, that's a, there are a number that are academic, but not all of them. So for example, um, when I was looking at, uh, uh, when I was doing undergraduate research and thinking about graduate school, I actually wasn't thinking about academic positions. I was thinking about research positions in the private sector. And I think that was pr primarily influenced by the fact that my father, who was a biochemist, uh, was worked in the pharmaceutical industry. And, uh, and, and that's just how I kind of thought about it, you know, in some sense. But um, I, was with a, I, was, I was with my undergraduate professor and um, I hope you can appreciate this story. We were doing a microsurgery on a, uh, using a double-headed microscope where I was looking in one set of the oculars and he was looking in the others and we were working together under the field. And this is my professor as, a, you know, as an undergrad. So he's an academic scientist. And we're just chatting while we're doing this work. And I was talking about my future. I said, I want to be, you know, I wanted to have a good job and I want to be, I want to go find a job in research and industry. I don't want to, you know, have a job where I have to, you know, be in an institution or teaching where I'm not sure. And I don't you know, maybe I don't get enough support because I had this sense that maybe he didn't get enough support. And at some point he listened to me because he was a great guy. By the way, he was a UC Davis graduate. His name was Ted Goslow. And uh, he did his PhD here in zoology some decades ago. And he, uh, at some point he stopped and he, pulls his eyes out of the thing and he looks at me across the microscope and he says, 
And we were doing a dissection on some animal. I was helping him with something because he was a comparative morphologist and he wanted to know how different animals, muscular, neuromuscular systems were adapted for different things that they do, like squirrels climbing trees versus birds flying. And he looked up and he says, do you really think that someone would pay me to do what I'm doing here in private industry somewhere? And I just stopped, you know, and I thought, oh, I get it. So what he was telling me was, he was saying, I, by being in academia, I drive my my intellectual interest and therefore my research agenda. You know, once I get this job, I am totally in charge of it. And I had to think about that a little bit. And then it just, it, what he did was he didn't change my mind, but he framed it for me in a different way. And I had to start, you know, I was learning, right? Ultimately, then I went to graduate school. Then in graduate school, you know, that's what you're, you're in academic settings. So then you really see what it's like. And then you understand, okay, there are different types of academic settings, you know? And the setting I was in as an undergraduate wasn't as intense research environment as I discovered when I got to the Brain Research Institute at UCLA or, or UCSD Medical School, right? So uh, then I realized, okay, well, you can, you can sort of set the parameters how much of my career should be research. So, so no, you can, go, you can go do research in various areas. I've had students and, and uh, trainees of mine that have gone off and worked for the government, do research for the government. Uh, one right now works uh, for, the, for the FAA. Uh, others who go off to private research institutes, uh, there are many of those around. The Salk Institute is a good example in San Diego uh, that are funded by uh, various different types of federal grants and private grants. The Allen Institute's another one. And they, they don't have, there's no academic component at all. It's 100% research. And then there's all the sort of stuff in between them. And so, it, so for me, what I really like about the academic research career is that you, you're not doing any one thing all of the time. So I get to be a teacher and I get to interact with students that these guys in research institutes don't get to do. And I still get to do the research and I can kind of pick how much, you know, how much I have to scale that I have a certain amount I got to get done, but I kind of get to scale that. And I also get to be involved in service and administrative roles. So actually for seven years, I was the Dean of Social Sciences here uh, at UC Davis. And that was a you know, administrative duty, academic administrative duty, but I was doing something really very different than being a teacher or a researcher. So I was, you know, running the college, right? So it, it um, academia gives you all those different things you can do and you can swim back and forth, you know? So I, I was doing heavy research, then I was asked to do this dean job. I had a lot of administrative duty for a while and then I finished that step down and then I came back and built my research back up again and started focusing on my teaching, you know? So it gives a person a lot of flexibility, but it's there are so many other things that one can do. One can go to Google. So one of my one of my former uh, students uh, left uh, and went and took a position as a professor at Sonoma State, and he did that for five or six years. And uh, recently, he made a change and he took a job at Google. So uh, you know, and he's going to he's looking really forward to focusing on kind of some of his intellectual research related interests uh, with this team at Google. And I don't know which group he's in, so I can't tell you, Roman, where he's at at Google. I'll have to find that out for you. I hope that answers the question. All right. I have a question for everybody on the panel or whoever wants to answer. What are the constraints of applying science and industry? And what are your favorite parts or challenges in this process? So I can kind of take a step up from the genetic counseling approach. Um, so industry in our field refers to labs that complete the actual genetic testing. So those are very specific labs. It's not like a Quest or a LabCorp um, or ARUP that does kind of like if you go to the doctor and they order a typical blood test, these are very specialized labs. And so genetic counselors who work in these genetic testing labs, they are not patient facing or very, very minimally patient facing role. So they handle the data um, and they do a lot of that analysis on the back end um, to see if genetic findings match a patient's clinical features and if there is or is not a genetic diagnosis. Um, and then once those results get to us, we do our also our own um, clinical interpretation. Um, so from a genetics perspective, genetic counseling perspective, the industry component um, really, is, the big difference is you're not seeing patients. Um, and kind of what Professor Mangan was saying is, we need academia to make our field bigger. So even though we 
we don't have a genetic counseling program specifically, we supervise genetic counseling students from other programs. So you have opportunities that industries don't. So industry doesn't typically have students that rotate through. Um, I, I haven't worked in industry, so I don't know the ins and outs of what their day-to-day -day looks like, um, but a lot of it is also connecting with, or essentially like getting clients. So um, UC Davis has contracts with specific genetic testing laboratories where they um, kind of give us uh, better pricing. And so there is a bit of a business aspect to that as well that comes with working on the industry side. All right, everybody, we uh, have a, another professional who's joined us midway through this event. Um, her name is Rena Mander. She's a speech language pathologist. So I'm going to pin her so that we can all see her and Rena, can you please share a little bit more about what being a speech language pathologist entails and how you got to where you are in like maybe four to five minutes? Yeah, I'm hoping I don't need four to five minutes. <laughs> um, my name is Rena Mander. I'm a speech language pathologist on the, pedi on the pediatric side. So I work in the school districts. I have been a speech language pathologist for approximately 12 years. Um, I have, I am currently a lead speech language pathologist overseeing eight charter schools. So I have two speech language pathologist assistants and one other SLP, which we say is speech language pathologist working underneath me. Um, what this job entails is we work with a variety of kids, including expressive and receptive language deficits, pragmatics articulation, fluency, and probably way more than that. So the domain is very, very wide. Um, as a credential speech therapist, um, we attend IEPs, which are individual education plan. Um, those are done on an annual basis, as well as every three years. So there's a lot of meetings and a lot of paperwork involved. Um, the perks of this job is you get to work with kids and you get to make an impact in their lives. Um, a lot of my philosophy is I take the social emotional aspect of it and I incorporate that in my therapy. Anything else, Ms. Jenkins? <laughs> All right, can you move your camera a little bit so we can see your face? You can't see me? There you go. Is that better? Oh, nope. No. Oh. There you go. Thanks. All right. Um, so for students in the audience, if anybody has a question for Rena about speech language pathology, now's a great time because I know her, her uh, she might need to get back to the meeting that she was in. And while we are um, waiting for any questions for Rena, we can move forward with other questions that are in the queue, Rachel. Yep. Um, oh, sorry. Did I cut somebody off? Oh, for Rena, we have a question. What was your training and education like? So I did my undergrad in a speech and language communication disorders at UOP. So that's a bachelor's. And then I did a two-year graduate program. And after that, I did a one year um, credentialing where you have to have a certain amount of hours to become a speech language pathologist. And in between all that, I had to take a state exam. All right, we have a question for Roman. Um, it's really long, so I'm gonna try and paraphrase it a little bit. Um, how does the work environment and workload of a startup compare to that of a larger company? And let's see, do you have any advice on how to balance the course load? This is a um, BS cognitive science and computer science student who's asking this. Um, how to balance the course load while making time to become a competitive internship or job applicant through personal projects, campus involvement, et cetera? Uh, thank you for the question, Sydney. Um, that's, a, that's a really good one. Um, I 
the, I'd have to say that my experience is a little limited on the startup side there, because um, I did do part-time work with a startup. Um, and um, uh, it's probably not very indicative of what it is. Uh, and further, I would say that startups vary just across the board. So you're gonna have a lot of different, a lot of different experiences. Uh, I do have some friends who who are uh, going through things with startups, and uh, they there's one there's some that enjoy it, some that don't, and again it's it's pretty varied. Um, but what I'll, what I will say about that is that you're very likely to experience uh, having to wear lots of different hats. You're going to be doing a lot of different things uh, at a startup when the team is smaller and when there's less established sort of norms for everything. Everybody kind of does a lot, right? Um, whereas in a larger company, you have a lot of structure, you have a lot of folks who are dedicated to particular types of tasks. Uh, there's a transition process if you want to change the kind of work you're doing. There's a rigid hierarchy potentially and you know how you move up and things like that. So those those are the kinds of things that you're going to be very likely to encounter. Um, it's going to impact consistency of work and it's going to impact your sort of trajectory through the through the space. Uh, as for how you might uh, balance your coursework, um, I would say one thing that uh, is, is, I don't know, just, uh, some pitfalls you could avoid is like taking on so much that it interrupts your ability to focus, to actually complete things, uh, to balance sort of your, your well-being. Uh, if, you're, if you're having issues with that, you might want to tone back on something. Something's got to give. Um, Professor Magnum said that uh, if there's you know students who have time and who are able to dedicate it, then they can get value out of that program. If you're in programs like his or you know many other ones, but you just don't have the bandwidth to actually make uh, good use of it, both you know for yourself and to like contribute something, uh, then you're really not going to see the kinds of results that you're hoping for. So um, you know it sounds very nice to be able to do a ton, but doing it well is probably going to uh, be a lot more impactful long term. All right, thank you. Farina, did you structure your undergrad studies specifically for your SLP graduate program? How competitive are SLP grad programs? And is it difficult to find opportunities to get the experience needed to get licensed? Okay, let's start with the first question. So was this my intention, like to be a speech language pathologist? Is that what you asked? What's the first question? Can you ask that again? Yes. Um, did you structure your undergrad studies specifically for your SLP grad program? I did not. I fell into it. So my undergrad was in um, nursing. And I was literally waiting for one class for like two semesters. And I was like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> so I waited a whole year to get into this one class to apply for the nursing program. And I'm like, okay, let me explore another avenue, which I can be in the medical field and have flexibility as a future mom. So I fell into it um, at UOP. I spoke with an advisor and they spoke about this program and it worked out beautifully. This program the speech language program allows so much flexibility and the demand of jobs is off the grid. What was the second part of the question, uh, Ms. Hale? How competitive are SLP grad programs? Um, there's a shortage of graduate programs. So I would safely say it's a pretty competitive program. Um, an average student probably would need up around 3.8 to 4.0 to get in. Tons and tons of experience in the field and probably some research behind that as well too. So it's a highly competitive program. I know that speech and language pathologists are now being expected to go into the doctorate program before they practice. First it was physical therapy, then it was occupational therapy. And we are the last ones um, to go into the expectation that we need to be of doctorate level to practice. And then the last question, is it difficult to find opportunities to get the experience needed to get licensed? No, so the schools, the colleges support you on that. So they have contracts with hospitals, schools and clinics, and they support you with the hours that you do need.
Thank you. You're welcome. For a list of graduate programs for speech language pathology, I did put a link to our health professions advising website in the Zoom chat. Thank you, Ms. Jenkins. <laughs> We don't have any more questions in the chat right now. So if you all have questions, please ask. We do. We did just get one popped up for Roman. Um, how did you work your way up to working for Google? Do you also work with people with a similar background in cognitive science? Hey, thank you for the question. Um, how did I work my way up to working for Google? Well, right out of uh, right out of college. I uh, uh, found a position um, that uh, really I got connected through to some folks that I, I knew. Uh, it was actually kind of difficult for a while. I, I graduated and, you know, I had the expectation of like, you know, everybody wants, uh, everyone to hire somebody with a computer science degree. And um, uh, that just felt like it wasn't the case. I had to go through a bunch of revisions of my resume. Uh, it took like almost two months. Um, one of the things that kind of did it for me towards the end is uh, uh, one of the workshops at UC Davis, uh, you know, I, I worked through my resume and one of the things they suggested was go through everybody on LinkedIn and just kind of vouch for the skills that you know that they, they, that they have. Uh, I happened to have some internships and some of the folks I, I pinged on there, you know, they, they vouched back for me uh, and someone said, hey, by the way, are you looking for something? I, uh, you know, have this position. Uh, and uh, you know that's kind of what, what kicked off the process. So the position is like kind of nice. It was with uh, with NASA, which is kind of cool. Uh, but it was a research position through San Jose State Research Foundation. So it was uh, you know it's, it's not uh, you know I'm not an employee of NASA at that point. But um, you know I, those, those just starting to work and starting to get get work done uh, kind of starts to you know build a bit of that portfolio. Uh, I mentioned, you know, trying to do things well as an important thing, but also keeping that sort of like constant like pressure of building of, of growing is an important part of it. So, uh, you know, once I have a position, it's now uh, a lot easier to get more. And so I kept my eyes open because it was a contract position. And um, so I ended up working with uh, or finding a, a company. Uh, and they didn't uh, they didn't pay quite as much as I thought that you know as much as I expected. But you know I, I was sort of like eager to to get settled in. I was uh, engaged at the time and wanted to have a steady job. Uh, the pay kind of came later and it, it worked out very well. But I kept on looking for other positions. Uh, you know as as that kept on going, learning more, um, and uh, you know even concurrently with my position and. Uh, uh, you know, Google kind of happened. So how did that part happen? Well, one of the companies I applied at was actually Google right out of college. And they took a year before they responded, which I thought was very odd. But uh, a year into my position, I had a, <laughs> a call from them and uh, we went along pretty far. Uh, I got to go on to the on-site interviews and uh, that's uh, you know, pretty decently far along in the process. And uh, then I got a no, and they gave me a little bit of feedback, but you know that's that's what it was. Uh, that being said, though, they followed up a year later, and then a year later again, and uh, you know that that apparently companies will do that, and you know if you're if you're persistent or you know they're persistent, you can kind of keep going with it. So um, eventually, I I did find like did find a, a team that I liked, and you know now that it was. Uh, uh, I had developed a lot of my personal skills and my personal sort of portfolio. Uh, I had a lot more of a pick of like what teams I get to join and what things I get to work with. And, um, you know, so that was good. So like I, I'd say like keep things going is an important part. And then uh, uh, like, don't, you know, don't give up, I guess. Stacy, can I jump in and piggyback to ask Roman a question? Okay, so just this morning, and this is for the whole panel, anybody can jump in, but I was thinking particularly given uh, Roman's role at Google, um, a freshman here at UC Davis, who happens to be related to me by being my son, asked, uh, as, a, as we were uh, driving on to campus, he said, um, 
Hey, Dad, how, how important are grades when you're trying to get a job? And I, I said, well, you know, I mean, you know, all else being equal, if someone has straight A's versus C's, I said, but I don't think the companies think about it quite that way, but I'm not really sure, but I'm going to be on a panel later and I'll ask. So Roman, <laughs> what, what do they look at in an undergraduate record? And what are the things that are the most important in your record, you think, that really, you know, made the difference? Great question. I think that's an excellent question. Um, that's part of why I was sort of emphasizing the fact that I was on academic probation. Um, there's some classes I had to retake. I was on academic probation and subject to dismissal. Um, like all of those kinds of things, like I feel like they do feel bad and they are recorded and they're, you know, they'll, you know, you'll put it on your transcript or, or whatever, or the, on your resume and stuff. Um, but it's not a deal breaker. And actually it's, I think even better, it's, it's an opportunity for, uh, framing your growth. Like if you, if you kind of struggle with something like if, if things come very easy to you it's hard to say what exactly happened you know were there like uh i don't know the connections is it what exactly kind of framed all that but if you worked through something and then kept going you know that when struggles are going to hit uh, or like whoever's like interviewing you or, or doing you know whoever's going to be managing they know that when struggles are going to hit and struggles will hit that you'll keep going you know and that says something way better than just like a, an a i think so I, like, I, it hasn't stopped me. I feel like I've gotten to a really good, uh, good place and I, I don't plan to stop. I plan to keep going much further, um, you know, regardless of whether I have bad cycles or whatever. Um, but, it, you know, that's not the end of the day, I would say, basically. If you guys don't mind, I would love to answer that one too. Um, for, for me, I guess it was more of, when I was going to do continuation in school. So um, like my undergrad, I uh, graduated cum laude, but I, and as far as work, they didn't look at grades or anything like that. It was like, okay, you have your degree, right? You have, um, this is your background and experience versus, okay, what was your GPA or what was your scores? It was more of experience and you got through it. <laughs> um, but as, as far as when I was, um, looking at my master's programs and, and submitting um, my work for a master's program. Yeah, they definitely looked at those grades and those were important to, to move forward. I would echo uh, Leah as well that going into work for my undergrad, I don't think grades played as much of an important role, but going into my graduate degree, they did look at grades. Um, of note, most genetic counseling programs are no longer requiring the GRE. Um, so that is a bit of a toss up, <laughs> um, but that is the trend that they're getting rid of that GRE requirement. All right, for people in the audience, if there's any last questions, I'd love for you to put it in the chat. Otherwise, I'll ask the question. All right. Um, so as we wrap up our event, I would love for each panelist to respond to tips that you might want to offer undergraduates as they're trying to find opportunities in your field um, or becoming qualified for your field. And um, no need to touch on things you've already touched on, but just what can students do now? I think I would, I'd like to say something. So I would, uh, I would say that finding out what you like is important um, uh, because right now is this pretty unique sort of place in your life where um, you both have lots of opportunities and um, you have the, the flexibility to go after many different things. So just uh, keep a, 
keep enough enough sort of bandwidth in your life that you can actually uh, both see opportunities and then follow through with them. Something on the C side is like on the, the C side on the making sure that you can actually see them is uh, network with people, talk about your interests, uh, explore whether you like things or not, and don't get too caught up with it. And on the like acting side, uh, make sure you have a bit of time and make sure that you have some habits that let you actually follow up on opportunities. Like don't, uh, don't say that you'll do something and then don't do it. You know, that that's not a good idea. Follow through and be aware. Uh, so UC Davis is unique in that they actually have a genetic counseling club um, through the undergraduate program. Um, so we do work closely with them and we do recruit a lot of our student assistant positions and genetic counseling assistant positions from that club. Um, so definitely get in touch with that group if that's something that you're even interested in learning more about. Um, that being said, I can definitely identify with that sense of urgency and needing to have a job and a career path right out of college. Um, but it is okay to take a year or two, or in my case, seven, <laughs> to try some different career paths and figure out what it is that you do like and what it is that you don't like and see what type of career opportunities um, best incorporate those features that you enjoy most in your day-to-day -day work. I would echo kind of the same thing that everybody's saying is like find something that you love doing um, and that doesn't necessarily seem like a job um, in the like, human services department. It's it's definitely about others and and seeing that growth is, is really important as far as what to do now. Um, if you want to get interested in my field would be um, looking for jobs as a um, behavior technician, registered behavior technician. Um, again, it only requires a high school degree and typically the company will do the training and pay for you to sit for like the test and do all of that stuff. Um, at least ours does. Um, and make sure that you get all your supervision hours to be done. Um, yeah, I think that was it. So, I would say uh, that those were that was all great advice, by the way, that you just heard from everybody, and and I agree with all of it. In fact, and you know, I think that one of the most important things now, as a student, and and as you graduate, as you go into your career and you live your life, you if you you really have to pursue, and and this this was already said, you pursue the things that you love. You know, find the things that are passions for you that you're interested in. And people will sometimes say, well, how do I get a job that's going to give me a good income? If you do that, you know, you might end up with a good income, but, you know, you're going to be happy. And, and by pursuing your passion doesn't mean you're trading off a good income for being happy. You know, that, there's not a, that's not an either or. What you're looking for is your passion, and it's going to lead you to the things that, that are actually productive for you as an individual and are going to be productive for society and are probably going to therefore be beneficial for you. And those, and you can't, it's hard to predict where those things, what those things exactly are going to be, especially in this, this new economy. It's new, not to, not to, it's new to me, not to all of you. Um, you know, and it, it, it's the case now that, that that you always hear this quote, that people will have X number of different jobs during their careers. But in my generation or the generation before, you know, they, you go to work for General Electric and that was it. And uh, so, and we don't even know what kind of jobs are going to be coming along exactly. So a lot of our PhD students in the psychology program here, for example, that graduate and go off and do things, they, several of them now, and this is common every year, they go off into private sector working as data scientists. Who would have thunk it? You know, what, what does that mean? They're not statisticians. They're not mathematicians. How come that? Well, because industry is looking for people who can think quantitatively. You know, done experimental work, done analysis, thought through things, and then they there are ways you can kind of transition to that. And they find these jobs in private sector as data scientists. And so, who you know, I couldn't have predicted that uh, 20 years ago. And so, just but again, following your passions. All these students are doing things that they find interesting, and you know that's the best you can hope out of life, right? To get a chance to do things that are that are that you really like doing. 
All right. Thank you so much, everybody. We really appreciate your time and um, all of the wonderful wisdom that you shared with us today. Um, I'm going to be uploading a recording of this event to our website for folks who missed it. So if you want to share that out, you can head over to our events website and find that link that I'll post on Friday. I'll toss that in the Zoom chat now. And if you all just want to give a Zoom round of applause for our speakers, then we'll end the event at that. So thank you, everybody. Bye.